So welcome everyone to the Initiative for Agency and Development Public Talk Series of 2022. I am Tohidu Rahman, a professor in Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics. And also I am the director of IFAD, the Initiative for Agency and Development. For external participant who is the first time attending this talk, IFAD is an experimentation initiative at University of Arizona. We are a group of interdisciplinary researchers working on identifying new frontiers in development through research, education, outreach programs for individual group and estate agency for development. Now it is my pleasure to introduce you our distinguished speaker, Dr. Sabina al -Kair. She is the director of the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative at Oxford University. Previously, she worked at George Washington University, Harvard University, Human Development Security Commission, World Bank. She has doctorate in economics from University of Oxford. More importantly, Dr. Alker is the leading, one of the leading economists in the world on issues of measurement of poverty. Along with Professor James Foster, uh, she wrote a paper on multidimensional uh, 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 multidimensional measurement of poverty in 2011. And one thing for economics audience here, as to, I checked this morning, it has over 4,200 citations, Google citations. For a paper on issues of poverty, that is seminal path-breaking paper. And beyond academic influence, her work has had profound influence on how we measure poverty around the world. And it has become one of the most widely reported and, 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 and is, uh, followed measures of poverty. So it is true honor that today she is, even though it is now almost dinner time for her, and I know she is in a hotel right now. And so it is a great honor that she can join us today. And so, so, so it is, it is, it, it, I'm really, really happy. Now, before I hand to Dr. Sabina, uh, a, a few logistical issues. She's going to talk about for approximately 50 minutes. And since it is a Zoom call, uh, Zoom talk, uh, she is going to talk uninterrupted. And following that, we will have approximately 30 minutes for question and answer. So now I hand over to Dr. Alkire. Thank you so much. It's lovely to be here with everybody. I'm looking forward most of all to our interchange, to our discussions, hearing your ideas and your, and your inputs, suggestions, criticisms. It's, it's just a privilege to be here and a privilege to be here also with Tahadur um, and to get to know a little bit this initiative for agency and development, two topics that are very close to my heart. And I'll be speaking a little bit about our common interest in Professor Amartya Sen uh, in a moment. I should have one uh, embarrassing um, notice, which is that I'm actually in quarantine for COVID in a hotel. And at some point they will drop my dinner. And so I'll have to just open the door and fetch my dinner and then um, close it and carry on. But I do apologize for the interruption that might cause. So um, friends, we are in a very grave moment. Um, we're in a grave moment for ourselves, and we're in a grave moment in the world um, with the war breaking out in Europe, um, with alliances um, being stretched and tested in ways that they have not been for a number of decades. And this is a time when it is easy, perhaps, to feel like we will disengage. It is also a time to feel that maybe a talk on multidimensional poverty has nothing to do with Ukraine, or to feel somehow that it's definite that things will get very, very bad. So I wanted to open with just one slide from Amartya Sen, which he wrote on April 15th, 2020, which was at the early stages of the COVID pandemic after the queen had come out with her message in England about when we will meet again. And he reminded the country that even during dark days, there can be positive lessons, including lessons for poverty. 
so and this was the Financial Times article, but it's, it summarizes a longer piece that he had already written. During World War II, there was a sharp reduction sorry, in the incidence of undernutrition in Britain. And it was a time when there was a reduction in total food availability. Food stocks had shrunk. And so Britain did a not very complicated and not very um, difficult policy, which is to ration food supplies and to provide social support to the widows and people in need. And, and again, many things that actually also occurred during the pandemic. But he pointed out that with the benefit of hindsight, we could see the results at a national scale. Because during the decade of the war in the 1940s, life expectancy rose by six and a half years for men. And then the decade before the war, it had risen only by 1.2 years for men. And during that decade, it rose by seven years for women, whereas before it was 1.5. And so a basic policy meant to protect life and to reach out in times of national crisis actually created more life, something positive out of very difficult structures. His question then is a question for us, standing as we are on the face of a great unknown, which is what positive can happen during the, the present crisis, because we have a pandemic and now we also have violence. And so what, depend, what this depends upon, as he observed, is what concerns come to the fore. So with that as a backdrop, my hope is that we will talk tonight about multidimensional poverty, today about multidimensional poverty, and that we will understand it from whatever disciplines we come from. And then perhaps with that concern, a shared concern among us, however each of us understand it in different ways, um, we might also think of how these kinds of concerns can come to the fore in times of international crises. So I will um, just have a couple words of preliminaries where I will introduce the man I just spoke about, Amartya Sen, because of course many people will not know what he is. Um, he gained the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1998 for his work in welfare economics, um, for very axiomatic, highly mathematical, proof-ridden uh, papers. And yet alongside those, he wrote very accessible media articles. And he also wrote a philosophical account that argued that when we think about justice, inequality, or poverty, we should think not about the amount of money we have, not about how happy we are, not even about the amount of resources we have. We should think about what we can do or be, our capabilities and our functions. Um, he is still an active professor in Harvard at the age of 87. Um, he was in the Washington Post earlier this month on his newest book, which is a memoir, of his earlier life, years in South Asia. Um, but his work continues to have salience at the cutting edge of economics and poverty work. For example, a 2013 book that he co-authored with his um, longtime associate, Jean Brez, called Uncertain Glory, India and, and, India and Its Contradiction, argued that development is best seen not in terms of economic growth, but in terms of expansion of ba ba people's basic freedoms or human capabilities. Economic growth might create capabilities and stronger human capabilities can increase productive and create productivity and create economic growth. But that which is of intrinsic importance, the goal is to expand human capabilities. 
and GDP per capita, GDP growth, is a means that's only valuable insofar as it amplifies people's abilities to be well and to do well. Jean Drez, you might know, when he was a student, for those of you who are a student, had such solidarity with the poor that he lived under a bridge on the streets in London School of Economics, and then later in a squatter's settlement. So Sen and Jaz's work goes under the title of the capability approach. And that approach really sees human progress as the progress in people's freedoms to live the kind of lives they reasonably value. And this approach is important because it began in 1979, but Jenkins, Steve Jenkins and John Micklewright, two leaders in the field of economics and measurement, said that it's Sen's approach and the capability approach, which has prompted a fundamental reconsideration of the concept of poverty, in particular, moving it away from money to looking at different deprivation that, as Sen and Anand put it, batter and diminish a person in many and various ways. The different deprivations or disadvantages that batter and diminish a person's life in many and various ways. That's what we are going to mean by multidimensional poverty. Think about it. You wake up and you can't turn on the light because there's no light. And then you hear rain because the roof's leaking. And then you get up to have breakfast, but maybe you're food insecure. You might go out to work, but maybe your work isn't so certain. So the experience of many poor people would be that several things are going wrong at the same time on a regular basis. And that's the concept we want to explore. I want to draw you to a couple other reasons then is a good guide for this work. One is that he doesn't keep to himself. Many academics published or perished. We publish in academic journals. We look for citations. We want to pack our CVs. But from the earliest times, Sen has also written in the newspapers. He's tried to write simply without jargon, without axioms or equations to try to raise awareness about very basic things like undernutrition or basic education. And he has done this over 30 years. He doesn't stop when, as most academics, we get bored and move on to the next new thing. So here's something from October of last year on the debate of where to store food grain in India that is best stored in the stomachs of children. And another feature that is useful is that the capability approach is not disciplinary. It's focused on an objective, it's focused on a problem. And so it's inquisitive beyond disciplinary barriers or borders. Um, when Sen got the Nobel Prize, one of his accoutrements that gained a lot of attention was the bicycle that he used to go around Shantaniketan and West Bengal in doing some of his field work. But that's an exemplary of a very mathematical economist going around on a bicycle to talk with children and teachers and health workers to truly really find out what's going on. So that feature of inquisitiveness and that idea of solving a problem and then of raising this to the media to invite other people to think, to argue, to debate, and to help is a, perhaps a feature of the kind of scholarship we're talking about when we come to talk about poverty. Another leader in the work of poverty was Sir Tony Atkinson, a late and beloved advisor of our research center. He wrote his first book on poverty in 1969. His last book was published posthumously in 2019. And it is also on poverty, measuring poverty around the world. And on the first page, he articulates that as an academic, he measures lots of things, but there's something different about measuring poverty. 
And what's different is that the measures of poverty have to link to action. Poverty statistics matter because they motivate other people, not as technical types. I'm a geek, I'm a numbers person. I'm not gonna motivate me, me, but they have to motivate other people to act and address a key challenge. And his first chapter of that book is looking at a book on economics that a president read in his vacation that changed the policies in America and other ways that ideas were transmitted to those in power. And so when we talk about poverty, you might think, oh, this is gonna be very measurement and we're gonna go into some measurements. But the aim of it is to link to all of you with your skills, whether it's ethnography, whether it's politics, whether it's theories of change or policies, social policy targeting um, or quantitative work to link all of us together into a common conversation. So in terms of the empirical work, I'm going to be presenting one particular measure, namely a global multidimensional poverty measure, which we developed in 2010 with the United Nations Development Program, and in particular with their Human Development Report Office. Remember that the Human Development Report Office came out in 1990 with the Human Development Index. And Amartya Sen and, Sen and, and, and Sudhir Anand came out with the Poverty Index in 1997. But at the 20 year anniversary of the HDR, they recognized that we have more microdata at the level of individual people than we had earlier when others were making the poverty measures. And also it was a time when Sir Tony Atkinson had called on people working on poverty to blend the European counting tradition together with axiomatic traditions. And so HDR said, look, can we do a measure that we can disaggregate so we can see how rural urban areas are different from urban areas, how the North is different from the South, how um, children are different from adults. And so that gave rise to the global MPI. <clears throat> We've computed it every year. It's been published in every human development report. And we update it at least once a year. Now with a joint report, which is launched by the administrator of the UNDP um, in September, October of each year. The world is different now than when we started the global MPI. So before I go into exactly the indicators the dimensions and the level of global MPI, I just want to set the context a little bit. When Sudhir Anand and Amartya Sen made the Human Poverty Index in 1997, nobody had ever really looked at multidimensional poverty in the developing world to that extent. By, if you fast forward to 2015, when 193 nations agreed the Sustainable Development Goal, goal one was to end poverty in all its forms everywhere. End poverty that is including extreme income poverty, but also including multidimensional poverty. So that's the first of 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Now there are 169 Sustainable Development Goals targets SDG target. The first is to end $1.90 a day poverty. The second is to cut by one half multidimensional poverty, according to national definitions. So the world has changed, and Sen was a big part of that change in opening space for wider notions. The SDGs also touch on two important aspects of poverty, which is the interlinked aspect and the integrated. So interlinked means that the SDGs want to look at who is deprived in different indicators on the same time. You can't turn on the lights, you hear the rain, you want to get breakfast, but you don't know what you have. These are interlinked deprivations of electricity, roof, and food. Integrated means that UNDP actually found through many, many studies, as did other organizations, that it was more cost-effective 
to address interlinked deprivation together in multi-sectoral or integrated policies. That what they, now they, the term is they break the silo. So it's not housing looking at housing and health looking at health and education looking at education. But the health minister knows that she cannot reach her health target if people are not educated and if they're not roads to hospitals. So she needs others to work with her so that she can meet her own goals because they are interlinked. So the global SDG, uh, the global MPI and national MPIs that are, will come to briefly at the end, um, fit in to this overall framework of looking at poverty in many dimensions. Now, the last thing to do is to think about measurement. And, and it can be terribly boring with lots of equations. So if you're into equations, I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint you. But let's consider uh, four people in four aspects of their lives. Let's call them Ta Natasha, Linda, Mohammed, and Maku. Let's look at health, schooling, housing, and nutritional status. ND means you're non-deprived. That is, your health is functioning. You have the, let's say, 12 years of schooling. You don't have a deprived house, and you're not undernourished, let's say, by a body mass index of 18.5. But Linda is deprived in health and undernourished. Mohammed has all four of the deprivation. And my poo has not completed six years of schooling or whatever the national compulsory schooling is. So you're clear that D means they're deprived and they're orange and ND means they're non-deprived. So you have four people, four dimensions and whether or not each person, yes or no, deprived or non-deprived is doing okay in that dimension or indicator, let's say. For simplicity at the moment, indicators are equally weighted. Now, the first thing we do is what Sir Tony Atkinson said, we count. How many deprivations does Linda have? Zero. Natasha, two. Mohammed four. Uh, Mapu, one. So you just count across. So you're aggregating for each person the different things that are going wrong at the same time. Okay. Now, the next question is, who is poor? Is it three of the four? Well, that would be true if any deprivation means you're poor. Is it only Mohammed? Because having four, clearly he is poor. Or is it something in the middle? Well, this is like monetary poverty. We can set a poverty line anywhere we want. The only thing is that we know that Linda is not poor. But we could say you're deprived if you have one or more, two or more, three or more, or four or more deprivations. So just like with income, $1 a day, $2 a day, $3 a day, you set your poverty line where you want. We can do the same in multidimensional space. Let's set it at two out of four. If you have two, three, or four deprivations, you're poor. So in that case, the middle two people are poor because the top one has two and the next one has four. Are you with me? And this person is non-poor. So already, gosh, already you're mathematicians. Already you know what proportion, what percent of the population are poor. It's 50%. It's two out of four. That's half of the MPI. Now, the second thing, and I'll explain why this happens later, is that we want to actually know something beyond who's poor. We want to know how poor they are because we want to be able to care about the poorest. So clearly, Linda with two out of four is less poor than Mohammed with four out of four. But let's look at their average intensity. She's deprived in half. He's deprived in 100%. So their average is 75%. We're going to call that in the intensity. On average, poor people in this society are poor, are deprived in three out of four indicators. So 
So now you can compute the MPI because the MPI is equal to H times A. One half of the population are poor, 50%. And you multiply that times the intensity, which is three quarters. So one half times three quarters is three eighths. So that's the MPI. It's very simple. You would doubt that it took a 12, a graduate, I mean, you don't think it takes a, an undergrad degree to get that done. So I'm a little bit ashamed that that's all that there is. It's not more complicated, but that is actually all that there is to computing um, multidimensional poverty in our methodology that we developed with James. We couldn't believe nobody had done it precisely that way before. Um, but because we've done it that way, there's some particular properties that make it useful that we'll come to later. Now, one of the properties is let's say Mohammed got some health benefits. So he became non-deprived in one of those deprivations. Remember, it was four and now it's three. Has the percentage of people who are poor changed? No, it's still, they're still poor because it's two or more, right? Has intensity changed? Yes. So now it's two out of four plus three out of four divided by two or five eighths. So MPI has changed. So that property, we call it dimensional monotonicity. But what it means is that if any deprivation of any poor person goes away, poverty goes down 100% of the time. And you might say that's obvious. What are you boring me about? The reason is that if you use the most common measure of poverty, which is the percentage of people who are poor, then if that deprivation goes away, he's still poor. Poverty has not changed. So we wanted to make a measure that gave people incentives to address the poorest of the poor and see the benefits of their actions. Okay, now let's go to the global MPI. It has three dimensions health, education, and living standards, the same as the Human Development Index. It has 10 indicators. You are deprived in nutrition if anybody in your household is undernourished. You're deprived in child mortality if very sadly a child has died in the last five years. You're deprived in years of schooling if no member of your household has completed six years of schooling. You're deprived in school attendance if any child in the household is not attending school up to the age at which they would complete class eight. Every kid has to be in school. Then you're deprived if you cook with solid cooking fuel. It's bad for your lungs and it's bad for the earth. You're deprived if you don't have adequate sanitation or if it's shared. You're deprived if you don't have safe drinking water or have to walk 30 minutes or more to get it. You're deprived if you don't have electricity. If your house has dirt floor or sand as a floor, and if its walls and roof are natural or rudimentary, things like plastic or just bamboo um, or tarps. And you're deprived if you don't own more than one of a set of assets. You can own one, but if you own two, you're not deprived. What are they? Phone, radio, including mobile phone, radio, television, computer, animal cart, bicycle, motorcycle, refrigerator. And if you own a car or truck, you are not deprived in assets. So what do we do with those indicators? which link to other SDGs, one, two, three, four, six, seven, and 11, by the way. Let me give you an example. For each person, we want to see if they are deprived or non-deprived. Back to the orange example, in each of the 10 indicators. So deprived is colored, but now it's red if it's health and blue if it's standard of living dimension, and white if they're non-deprived. And then now the dimensions are equally weighted, but indicators within the dimensions 
are equally weighted, but there's more in standard of living, so they weight less. And you can see visually that they weigh one sixth of that dimension's value. So this is Tamang. She's a woman in Nepal, um, in a rural area. She gathers firewood and sells it. Dangerous occupation because the, the forest also has rhinoceros, who are not the nicest of neighbors. Um, she has electricity. She has one light bulb, but she doesn't have clean cooking fuel, elect, um, good water, sanitation, um, housing, or assets. Um, her husband is undernourished. Um, and as you can see, they have uh, achievements in education. So if you add up her deprivations, it's 44.4%. Is that a good summation of her life? Obviously not. Look at her face. She's so beautiful. And she was very happy. She was very happy because she was boasting about her daughters. They have a very harmonious family and just lots of love and good relationships. So poverty doesn't tell you everything about a person, whether the good or the bad, the danger from the rhino, is the fact that her husband is disabled, nor the joy she has from the love of her kids. But she's identified as poor because in this case, the cutoff is one third, 33.3%. And her deprivation score is 44.4%. She's above it, so she's poor. And so now you know how to get from that to the MPI. I won't go over it again. So what are some results? And these are joint with the Human Development Report Office. This year we cover 109 developing countries and 5.9 billion people. That's about 92% of people in the developing world, about three quarters of the world's population. We disaggregate this for 1,291 subnational regions by ethnicity, by caste in India, by gender of the household head. Um, and the data are from 2009 to 2019-20. So it's a long window. 84% of the poor have data from 2015 to 2020. And 22 countries have data from 2019 or 2020. But none of our data are post-pandemic. We're still waiting. We use demographic and health surveys for 51 countries, sorry, for 45 countries, multiple indicator cluster surveys for 45, and national surveys for 13. Of course, not every country is covered. We would have wanted to include work or empowerment or violence, but we don't have data for this. There's my connection. The surveys that we have are not updated as often as we would wish, only every three to five years often. But it's better than it used to be. So what do we find? Of those 5.9 billion people, 1.3 billion people experienced deprivations in at least one third or more of the weighted indicators. You got me? They're identified as poor because they, like Tamang, have a deprivation score of 33% or higher. Of that 1.3 billion people now, half are children. They're people under the age of 18. One in three children under the age of 18 in developing world is multidimensionally poor, and one in six adults. It's very sobering, and we must do something about the children. We have more poor children on this earth than we've ever had before. Of those poor people, 1.3 billion, 85% live in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, similar numbers in each. Do they live in low-income countries? One third do, but two thirds live in middle-income countries. But in middle-income countries, some countries have 1.1% of their population as poor, and others 
have 67% and subnationally up to 90%. So middle income countries have a huge diversity of experiences of poverty. Now, when we say it's multidimensional, when the SDGs say that deprivations are interlinked, they really, really are. So we have 1.3 billion people. 1 billion of them don't have solid cooking fuel. 1 billion lack inadequate sanitation. 1 billion have substandard housing. So you can already see that many people have all three of those at the same time. 788 million live in a household with at least one undernourished person. And half cannot turn on a light when dark falls, half of them. So these are quite pervasive deprivations in our day. Um, and it's, it's sobering, but it's important to look at because these are only the people that are deprived in at least one third or more. 4.2 billion people are deprived in at least one of the 10 indicators. So what happens within a household? What happens for women? We don't have three genders. We just have women and men, except in one country, Colombia. So we find that of those 1.3 billion poor people, two thirds of them, 836 of them, million, live in a household in which no girl or woman has completed at least six years of schooling. Now, we believe in girls' education. We know that an educated mother sends her girls to school, that they're, they're less undernourished. The United Nations organization, NGOs, many have been advocating girls' education. And it's so sobering that this year we pulled those numbers apart and we found that we're still a long way away. So we need your voices to continue to argue for the girls and their education. Looking a little bit more closely at that figure, actually, it's not so good because half of the poor also don't have an educated man. One sixth of the poor, 215 million, do have a man who is completed, or a boy, who's completed six years of schooling, but they don't have a girl or woman. All of them have a girl or woman at home who could have completed six years of schooling, but she hasn't. So this is something that here in 2022, we still need to work on. Unsurprisingly, we also find that in male headed households, uh, gender and intimate partner violence is higher in poorer countries, but actually in some of the poorest countries, it's not the highest. And so there are relationships we need to understand much better when we look at cultural patterns of domestic violence. Now, question, is this the same as $1.90 a day? Remember, target 1.1 is to end dollar a day poverty. 1.2 is MPI. So in this graphic, the dot is the percentage of the population who are poor by $1.90 a day. And the bar is the percentage who are poor by MPI. So we can compare them because it's the percentage of people. And what you can see is that on the left-hand side, <clears throat> they sort of agree. The low poverty places agree. But everywhere else, you see the dots are really quite up and down. Some are higher than the line, some are way low. So they're not saying the same story. We like to think that they're like two eyes. If you've ever had an eye injury, you know that if you try to pour your cup of tea, you might miss your cup. Because with two eyes, you see in three dimensions. So we think you need monetary poverty measures and you need multidimensional poverty measures because they complement each other. How about for caste and ethnicity? It's not a perfect study, but for 40 countries and 2.4 billion people, we could disaggregate our measure by ethnicity and caste. And in Gabon and Nigeria, the poorest ethnic group was 70 percentage times poorer than the least poor. So we're talking very, very big differences. 
and in Burkina Faso and Chad, the nine poorest ethnic groups had more than 90% of their population being poor. Just a couple examples in Vietnam, 14% of the population come from ethnic minorities, 14%. But almost half of the poor, 47.5% of the poor people are from ethnic minorities. And in Bolivia, 44% um, of the population are from the indigenous communities, but it's three quarters of the poor. And what you can see there is that the uh, Quechua and other indigenous have about 20 percentage of their 20 percent of their population is in poor in poverty, but the Ayamara it's only 10. So there's also disparities within indigenous groups in Bolivia. So it's important not just to look by geography. Other years we've looked at disability status, um, and I already mentioned children. Finally, the MPI shows you not only who is poor but what to do. Remember, we have the row for each person. So we know exactly what deprivations we need to get rid of to end poverty. So these are two ethnic groups in Gambia, Wolof and Sarahui. They have about the same level of MPI. But what you can see is that the red bars are higher in the five rightmost um, columns, plus years of schooling, and the blue are higher in the left. So what, they, what needs to be fixed to get them to zero poverty is not the same. You can use the MPI both to see who is poorest and how they are poor, so you can address their poverty effectively. Um, I'm going to, well, I'll, I'll say we used post-COVID high-frequency World Bank surveys and microdata from them for 45 countries. And we also looked at emergency social protection, non-wage work, and children out of school. And as you can imagine, it was tended to be higher in the poorest country. So we've done what we can to make this relevant with post-COVID data. But I wanted to show you two things in the last 10 minutes. One is how we look at a given country like Nigeria. And the second is how we look at changes over time, like in India. Now, this is the global MPI for Nigeria. Nigeria also has a national MPI. According to the global MPI, 46.4% of people are poor, and average intensity is 54.8. So you multiply 0 0.5 by 0 0.5, and what do you get? 0.25. You can do that in your head. That's the MPI. What's interesting is that then we can see, well, how is it different from other countries? So it's next, it's on the left, next to Malawi and Yemen. And you can see that just you get the impression that the colored bars are different because the indicator composition of poverty in Nigeria is more aimed at health deprivations and less at standard of living than, for example, in Malawi. Um, so this shows the percentage or the number, you can do it both ways, of people who are poor and are deprived in each indicator. Um, with nutrition and cooking fuel and sanitation being the biggest deprivations. If you look by rural and urban areas, whereas nationally 46% of people are poor, in the urban areas it's 23%, half of it. And in the rural areas it's 65. So it's, it's much stronger in rural areas. And if you look by the states, of Nigeria, <clears throat> the red and dark red are the poorest regions. So you see the poverty is, is quite visibly higher in the northern and northeastern areas of Nigeria. Um, and to give an idea, in um, Kebe, which is the poorest, it's 87.4% of people who are poor, whereas in Lagos, it's 4.1%. So 4% to 87% in the same country. Now I have a question for you. Can we disaggregate $1.90 a day poverty measures? 
Can we go inside Nigeria like this for $1.90 a day? We can't. It's much harder because of how um, the price, the poverty lines are set. And so the MPI, because it measures deprivations directly, it can be disaggregated. And it's quite important to use that information where we can get it. And all of this is online in country briefings and tables. We also might want to look at Nigeria in context. So again, this is Nigeria, but then how is it compared oops, to Ghana or to Chad or to other, other countries, Cameroon? And you can see that, for example, the dark green bits on the far west, southwest of Nigeria are adjacent to red bits in the country next door. So what's going on on that border? What's Nigeria doing right? You answer some interesting research questions. But look at the border of Nigeria and Niger. Some lighter red areas are pegged up against darker ones in Niger. Again, what can we learn from those regions? And everything that I've showed you about knowing the composition of poverty across countries is the same for any, any disaggregation. So these are the states of Nigeria, Kebe, is the tallest bar, it's the poorest state, Lagos is the least poor. And we can see how the composition of poverty is different. So let's say you wanted to work on Kebe, then you would know what are the deprivations that we really need to address. And how is it different from Sokoto, which is next to it? This is a different graphic with the same ordering, but just easier to see, particularly the less poor places. And you can see that in Lagos, health deprivations, the red ones, contribute a lot on the far right. Um, the last thing, if you are actually going to make policy or make budgets, is that you also need to know not the level, not the composition by indicator, but also the number of people. So you have to multiply each state by the number of population. So remember, Kebe, which I don't know if you can see, is a, a, a maroon. At, at sort of just past six o'clock on this thing is the poorest, but Katsina has the highest number of poor people with 8.7 million of the 93 million poor people in Nigeria. And Kano in the North also has a lot. So we need to think about both of these, the number and the level when we're making policy. Okay, I'm done with numbers. Um, we can look at children, we can look at gender and intra-household. But you get the idea, and we can look at ethnicities. I want to end on a happy story, and that's how poverty can come down. So with a global MPI, we do trends for 80 countries and 5 billion people, and 70 of those countries had a significant reduction in at least one period. 14 of the fastest producers were in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, 23 countries reduced all 10 indicators significantly. And some countries reduced poverty in their poorest region, North Central in Liberia, Province 2 in Nepal, Tilhet in Bangladesh, Tambacounda in Senegal. They made the fastest progress. They're catching up, not being left behind. But they were not straight shots. So we need to look at the details. Each one. And it wasn't also that case with children. Um, children, for example, either had no reduction or slower reduction in nearly half of the country. Now, we can consider India um, as one example where we look a little bit deeper. We use India over 10 years. 2015-16, and just to put these findings in context, I want to remind you that it was because of China's amazing work in reducing monetary poverty that we met the first millennium development goal, the monetary part, which was cutting monetary poverty by half. The other part was reducing undernutrition, which we did not meet. And in the decade from 1995 to 2005, 
268 million people came out of poverty in China. And the World Bank people found that in a 12 year period, 267 came out. When we looked at what happened with the global MPI in India, we found they cut it from 55 to 28% of the population being poor in 10 years. So over 270 million people came out of poverty in that decade. It's a change of historic importance, similar to that of China. But did we read about it? Did we know about it? We have academic papers, you can look at that. It's a very robust finding. But I just want to look a little bit more into that. This is how India reduced poverty. So the length of the bar is how fast it reduced deprivations in all of the indicators. So assets, the dark one on the right-hand side, reduced the fastest, then cooking fuel and sanitation and undernutrition. A very happy part of India's story is that the poorest reduced poverty the fastest. So in this graphic, the bubbles represent states. The poorest states are on the far right. And the size of the bubble is the number of poor people. And the bubbles, it's a race towards zero poverty. And so the bubbles towards the bottom of the slide are running the fastest. So this is a happy story because what we see is Jharkhand, Bihar, Chhattisgarh, they are reducing poverty the fastest. They're catching up. They're not being left behind. It's not the case in other countries we looked at necessarily, although in some it is. And it also wasn't the case actually in the previous period in India when Bihar, the poorest state, had zero significant reduction of poverty. But it is that in the, in the decade that we just presented, of course, hopefully the numbers will be updated for India soon. It was the case also for children, also by caste, also by religious groups, that the poorest reduced poverty the fastest. Um, and so that's really what I wanted to convey of the global MPI, what it is, how you measure it, why it's important to measure, but also to write in the newspaper, to get on your bicycle and go around and be inquisitive, to bring different disciplines to this. And then really to think together how in this very troubled time, coming out of the pandemic, when we know poverty's worse, coming into a war, when we view with trepidation what will occur, we need to think together practically on this. And I'll just leave you with one slide to say that many countries are actively working on national frameworks to reduce multidimensional poverty. And we also hope that academics will be part of ongoing efforts to lift our voices and our pens and fingers in that direction. So thank you so very much. And back to you, Talador. Thank you for wonderful presentation. Now we will open to questions. And, and so, so if anyone has a question directly, you can ask. So, so let, or you can raise hand. So uh, uh, Dr. Alkire, I had a few questions before other people ask. I will ask a few questions. One thing is so that uh, is if you if you to the extent you can I know that from your work theoretical work and 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 other works is that you care about how you assign weights carefully. I mean you, you looked at so when you think about multidimensional poverty measure, to what extent the conclusions, not the extent of measurement of poverty, but international picture changes. If you alter the weighting, how you assign the weights, how sensitive is the results? Uh, particularly, that is one uh, question I had. And, and, and related to that, and then and I will leave it there, and is that when you think about multidimensional poverty, one underlying question is, what exactly, let's say, as you pointed it out, and Amartya Sen 
and, and there has been a significant intellectual tradition that what poverty actually entails, you know, it has multi-dimensional aspect, but at the core of it, like let's say if it is nutritional, nutrition-based poverty. So, so the, think about a person who is, uh, you look at multi-dimensional indicator, I have better housing condition, I have electricity, I have access to basic education, but I am undernourished. So am I poor or not there? So like, so, 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 so the, what I am trying to raise it is that why you do not, instead of giving equal weights, uh, you make some value judgment, axiomatic, and say that certain aspect of poverty is more profound, more fundamental, because it requires your ability to function. You know, at least you are, if you are not, you don't have basic health, basic nutrition, housing, electricity, all those things perhaps can be argued that it is second order consideration. So that means, so, so that, that was one, one thing if you can comment. Thank you so much. Um, that's a brilliant question. Um, so in terms of weight, Oops, sorry. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned, each dimension in the global MPI weights one third, one third, one third, and then the indicators within are equal. So on health and education, each weights one sixth, and in standard of living, it's one eighteenth. But hang on, I'm the minister of health. It's a time of COVID. I want health to weight one half. So we say okay. No, I'm the Minister of Education. Building back from COVID, children are out of school. It's one half for education. Okay. No standard of living. We, we've been cooped up in our houses. We need water, sanitation, electricity, connectivity. Okay. So what Amartya Sen said was something very important. And he said it repeatedly. He said, it's not an embarrassment to set weight. But social judgment, like a poverty measure, needs to be robust to a range of plausible weights. So we disagree with each other. I disagree with myself all the time. And so um, we have to sort of gather. And in the case of the global MPI, we said, okay, any dimension can weigh anything between 25% and 50%. We're gonna allow those weights to vary. And then we compute analytical standard errors at 95% confidence intervals. And then we looked at the ranking, pairwise ranking of the countries, considering their standard errors, but using strict comparisons, not Davidson and Duclo weak ones. And we found that 89.7% of pairwise comparisons are robust. What does that mean? They're the same. It's 25%, it's 50%, nearly 90% of the pairwise comparisons between countries are not affected. And so that provides a kind of stability. Now it's not perfect because clearly if it was perfect, there'd be no value to having a multidimensional measure. So, you know, you, but that is the approach that we've gone to in terms of looking at the robustness to the range of weights. And then how do we actually set weights? Well, when we began, James Foster was very much involved, I was not, um, with government of Mexico. And they were at that moment designing their national MPI. And there were lots of discussions on how to set weight. But subsequently, it's been quite interesting that most countries have decided, following the advice of Tony Atkinson, to choose dimensions such that they can be roughly equal in weight. Why? Because again, the purpose of a poverty measure is to link to action. And if the policymaker can understand the measure, it's quite useful. And if they are, you know, weights based on some other thing, it might be difficult to explain. Um, they adjust them. So Chile will give lighter weight to some uh, social capital dimension, or others will give a, a lighter weight to some indicator that they think is less proper less robust, has higher non-sampling measurement error. So there will be adjustment, but that's the basic structure. And to our interest, most countries have followed it. Our initial conversations and debates were 
primarily about weight. And now they're really not. They're, they are, they exist, but they're on other topics. Oh, thank you. Uh, Prashit, you have a question. Go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Rahman and Dr. Alkir for this uh, uh, talk. I have a question uh, regarding, you know, adding new, uh, let's say new indicators uh, um, to the MPI. For, uh, you already mentioned there are some, you know, uh, some difficulties adding, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, uh, indicators based on, let's say domestic violence, or maybe if somebody wants to measure racism in some way. So where do you think uh, um, these indicators will fit in in these three broad domains? Or do we need to like have a different domain and different weighting system uh, you know, to incorporate those indicators? Thank you. No, thank you so much, Prashit. Um, so the technology is flexible. I showed you four domains. Then I showed you the MPI with 10, 10 indicators, four indicators and 10 indicators. Um, national MPIs have seven to 22 indicators. They have three to uh, seven dimensions. So they vary a lot across countries. And many countries now have official MPIs, which include different indicators. And some, for example, El Salvador includes violence in its MPI. Um, and so some have violence as a category itself or as a combined indicator in another category, like the livid environment, as they do in Chile, where they include violence. Um, in terms of racism, it's a good question because you could try to include in a poverty measure attitudes of discrimination. For example, you could say, do you feel that you have been discriminated against because of your race? Or do you feel that people in your community are discriminated against because of your race? I, and that's possible. And we do actually have those questions in some modules that we work on. But I think it's almost more powerful to disaggregate by ethnicity as we did, and to show that the absolute poverty inequalities by race are very high. <clears throat> and that might then lead one to then ask about to what extent are people uh, are people's answers to these questions coherent with this differences. Um, so I think we have to always think what should the, be within the poverty measure, how should it be disaggregated? And what role do more self-report questions have in, in a poverty measure? Uh, Salma, you. go ahead. Good evening from this part of the world. It's evening in Africa. I'm Salma, I'm based in Pretoria. Uh, thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation. As I was listening, and especially when you were talking, uh, when you made an example of saying, if I'm the health minister, I would probably want to. So it, it took me back to the time when we were helping the South African government uh, with the SDG report and looking at the different SDGs. I mean, like when it comes to whether it's health, whether, I mean, when you talk multidimensional poverty, you looked at all those indicators. Now, how challenging is it, especially for the developing countries, with limited resources to be able to say which ones are the priority that we should focus on in order to ensure that, I mean, you talked of child poverty. And when one thing of children, you're probably thinking access to education or to health. So one is sitting here wondering, I mean, how can we tackle which one first? Or I mean, which one will lead to accelerate or address or help others, you know, to be able to say, because when it comes to the policymakers, the, the ones for health will say, but health should be at the center because if we address health, then we address everything else. The one of education would say that. So I was just sitting here wondering, based on your experience and the different countries you worked on, how, for example, India, what is it that India did for especially those poorest uh, states and what to be able to pull through at that level? Thank you so much. No, thank you very much. I love Pretoria. <laughs> it's lovely to hear from you. Um, 
So uh, as I'm sure you know, South Africa has the national MPI, SAMPI, um, which is made by SATS um, yeah, and yes. which is a national MPI. So it is the global MPI plus unemployment. And so how do people decide what to do? I'll give the example of Colombia. In Colombia, um, and this would be interesting perhaps to some of you who are more in management or uh, business administration. Um, when the president Santos um, launched the MPI, then people in his office set targets, to reduce it within his term of office. Um, and so they made those targets from four years down to every year a target for each indicator. And there were 15 indicators in the five dimensions. So he set up a round table that he personally chaired as president of the Republic. Every minister had to come in person. She could not send a deputy. And they met twice a year and he would say, minister, what's happening in your indicator? And the, the statistics group would put up a red, yellow, green stoplights and they could see which indicators were stuck and not working. But the thing with poverty is that it's a team sport. Many times ministers compete. They want you know, prestige, they want the next political job, whatever. But poverty is a team sport, it's too important for that. And so you have to play together. And so if there was an indicator that was stuck, one year it might be housing, everybody would think, what can we do? And to really move this indicator this year. Next year it was preschool. Next year it was uh, youth unemployment. And the, the slide that the government of Colombia shows about that period, um, and it's continued into the next government, is that they made decisions that really catalyzed change in the indicators that were stuck. Um, and they also aligned the budget allocation with the deprivations according to the percentage of the people who were poor and deprived in each indicator. And so there was you know, a, a bit of a, a synergy between the two. So that kind of coordination it was possible in that place. Uh, it's been adopted also by Costa Rica, by some other countries, it hasn't worked in others. So every place has to find its own champions and its own way. We do have now an executive education course, one week in English, one, and then a second course in Spanish, um, where some former heads of state and for the former ministers actually talk about what they did and interact with people because everybody's sort of making it up in their own context because we haven't been here before, but time is tight. We have to address multiple goals together. And the MPI is a good tool to do that, but we have to keep learning how others are, are managing to do it. Thank you. Now, next is Jakaria, go ahead, from India. Hi, uh, I'm Zakaria. Um, I'm actually sitting in Kerala in the middle of the night, listening to your lecture. Thank you very much. Who are you? Your, uh, but it is a topic that is very close to my heart. So I had to keep myself awake. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for your lecture. My question actually emerges from, uh, you know, the very base of the fact that when we actually measure these dimensions in a dichotomous way of you know measuring them in in the sense whether you are deprived zero one kind of situation and uh, at some point of time you know you actually end up when you have no deprivation of that nature and but you see that poverty is still felt by people in the society i am particularly uh, facing that problem because I am in Kerala and you know the multidimensional poverty is about one percent. Uh, I mean it's less than one percent but when you put a you know round figure then you make it one percent and I see you know there is a lot of poverty uh, at, at least it, it's not as prevalent as I am actually from Bihar so uh, not as prevalent as I see in Bihar but it does not mean it has disappeared. In fact, even from the consumption data that we measured, the, the Rangarajan committee report that it measured based on that, it said that we have something like 7% poverty uh, from the consumption point of view. But my re 
calculation of consumption poverty when I actually account for proper nutritional deprivation in the context of Kerala, I get a poverty estimate of 17%. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, uh, so my question is that if, uh, you know, if these asset based or, you know, zero one kind of situation, because India had Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan, uh, you know, universal education program in 2000, uh, 2000s and by 2010, uh, you know, uh, those kids are out of, uh, they are getting out of school now. So you see a massive increment. But there is, uh, you know, massive improvement in multidimensional food. But, you know, child, uh, child deprivation will remain a serious challenge for time to come. So now it is going to be very slow, you know, progress. So my, my basic question is that, you know, how do we, how do we deal with where we, we will stop at multidimensional poverty? Will we, will we stop calculating multidimensional poverty after a certain level? Or what, what will happen? Because Kerala is already hitting the roof. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And it's not just Kerala. Um, it's Lagos, it's Addis Ababa, it's many um, less poor regions or um, areas of countries. And then it's Ukraine, Serbia, um, uh, Colombia, you know, many of the Latin American countries, the Arab countries, MPI is irrelevant to them. So two things, at the, nat at the global level, when we revised the MPI in 2018 with Ushikanagaratnam and Nikolai Sopa, we set ourselves a rule. To revise the global MPI, we need data for 75 countries and 3.5 billion people. And we couldn't get it for a moderate MPI. We can get it for education. The kids have to complete 10 years of schooling. Um, there has to be somebody with at least eight or nine years of schooling in the household, not just six. Um, you can get it for living standards, flush toilet, water pipes into the premises, um, et cetera. But health is the problem. You can add obesity, but you don't really have better health indicators in the NFHS um, that are present. Some countries have health insurance. Some countries have this and that. But on the surveys we have, we are, we're actually poor on the health front. And so for that reason in 2018, we were not able to make a moderate poverty measure. Right now, my team are still working on it every day. So we have a team of people working to see what we can do. Um, but what you can do is you can use NFHS 4 and NFHS 5 and, and do something better. So the India national MPI adds bank accounts and um, maternity, maternal health for women as two additional indicators. The national MPI has 12, but you could also raise the years of schooling. You could raise the sanitation or the water or the housing. Um, so it's completely paka, not semi paka. Um, you could, the materials, uh, you could add more assets. So you can make a moderate measure. It's just, we couldn't compare it to other countries. And in the NFHS, you have things like you have anemia, you have um, anthropometrics um, of obesity, uh, you have other variables that you could use, but you don't necessarily have them in other countries. Um, you even have, as you know, domestic violence experiences of it, not the attitudes. So that's um, what I would suggest that, that you and, and friends in Kerala could do. Um, but for, at the global level, we're still working. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jessica, next. So we have a lot of questions. Uh, maybe uh, we, uh, uh, Sabina, we take a few questions and then you answer. Okay. Okay, yeah. great. Jessica, go ahead. Hello, Sabina. My name is Hi. Jessica. <laughs> I am a Master's of Development Practice student at the University of Arizona. So I'm kind of curious to know how uh, you know, indicators of MPI are measured. Um, so for instance, is there like um, a particular way we can know, oh, when it gets to this, um, for instance, from nutrition poverty, like when it gets to this particular level, these people are like above, you know, the nutrition poverty line or they are below the nutrition poverty line, or is there like a global scale for like measuring MPI? So that's a very good question. Oh. 
sorry. So you, you want to answer quickly or before? Just very quickly. Okay. Yes, so there are two approaches. What I presented today is the global MPI, which is a comparable yardstick. It's the same in Kerala as it is in Bihar. It's the same in um, North Macedonia as it is in Niger. But as you said, the national MPIs, you can choose the indicators that you have in your survey. You can adapt them. It could be a women's empowerment and agriculture index, which we've made. It could be a fuel poverty index. It could be a time use index. It could be a vulnerability index. Um, so you can change the indicators. So the, the mathematical structure is the same. And in the second approach, it's really what, what problem you are trying to solve with it. And then you can make it your own. Well, thank you. Uh, Jessica, no? Lina, go ahead. Lina, you had questions. She's not here. So there is one question. Linda, are you in audience still? Uh, the, there is a question in the chat room. So she, I think she's not here. So uh, uh, Sabina, I had few other questions and I'm going to ask because I'm going to monopolize it before other people jump in. Uh, and this is related to your response and, and, and some mm -hmm. of the questions that came. One is, this is just out of curiosity, is when you think about multidimensional or the measurement aspect of it, is that some of the data is could be referring to, let's say 2021, like let's say for example, and some of the data indicators that they are dated, right? So when you try to uh, come up with one aggregated measure, do you consider these factors that in different countries, different indicators are referring to different time period and you know, education, health, uh, housing conditions, income, and how do you reconcile that? I mean, do you account for some of it or there is no way we can do it? You know, we have to do what we have given the constraint. That's a great question. So we take all of the variables from the same survey. So if you think of the social progress index or human development index or Legatum prosperity index or others, they will be getting different indicators from different surveys. We can't do that. Yeah. So we need one survey with unit level data about each person. Yeah. So everybody in India has data from 2015-16. Okay. Everybody in Bangladesh has data from 2019. Everybody in Nepal, it's 2019. Everybody in, I don't know, Sri Lanka, it's 2016. So for any country, it's the same, but across countries, it's different. And that's a problem. The World Bank has that problem with $1.90 a day. And so they now cast, they use, you know, growth figures and, um, but we don't do that. And the reason we don't do that is that it's still too difficult to predict. Yeah. And we don't want to give countries an incentive not to gather data. We'd rather provide an incentive for them to gather the data and have their figures updated. And so that's at the moment what we've chosen to do. We have as academic exercises done projections, logistic um, models of how poverty probably went down um, across countries. And we'll be extending those to look subnationally and to look over more time periods. But that's at the level of research. And so for policy, we're not yet comfortable um, that they are accurate enough. So. Um, there is a group which released a chapter in a report by the city group, um, a private sector company, um, where they threw lots of variables at the MPI and, and were able to predict it between surveys. So there are groups that are also trying to do that. Um, but we are, uh, we don't want to give policy advice that could be wrong. So we'd rather at the moment just focus on updated data. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so one last, uh, my question, and then and I, it, there are other questions in, in the chat. Uh, th this is just curious. <clears throat> Since you have started working, you know, MPI is now 
used worldwide and particularly with your partnership with UNDP, uh, have you faced some political pushback? So like, for example, you know, in doing business ranking by the World Bank, different countries have been, uh, you know, there was a scandal, everybody knows this is no secret. But so Sabina, have you received some feedback from different countries that their countries are not being reflected accurately on MPI, MPI index and measurement? No, I mean, very early on, HDRO did. So very early on, Cuba and South Africa um, had questions about the, the MPI uh, and particularly about consultations and, and the, the procedural part, okay. which um, they handled. And so I don't know all the details, but I can, and one, you know, if countries have questions, everything we do is online. You can download our data, our, our, our do files. You have to get the data yourself. It's all free, but we can't, it's not ours. Um, you download the data, you run our do files, you get our results. And so we just try and we write for every country, we write um, how we treat the variables, if it's any different and why we do it that way. So if you, you have more inside knowledge and you say we're wrong, you know, you will know why we did what we did. And, and then we can talk about it. Um, and so we actually haven't had pushback. Um, I don't know if countries are just being nice or if they're not, but yeah, that's not been part of our experience. Okay, okay. So I'm going to, there are some questions in the chat and some of them have been just given to me. So there is one, Linda, are you in audience? Yeah, go ahead, ask your question. Um, I'm here, but my, my background is it's kind of noisy. I don't know. I can hear you. Is it fine? Yes, yes, you, yes, you are fine. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. Oh, okay. Can. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I, okay. I enjoy the lectures. Uh, I really appreciate the training. So um, recently, I um, applied the methodology in my study. Um, I'm a student. So I use it to compare, although I applied in the micro level, so I was comparing um, between two groups of farmers to see who is doing better in terms of their multidimensional poverty level. So I noticed that um, one group had the intensity, the poverty intensity was a bit higher. However, when, when I combined with the head, head count, then I noticed that the other one was um, had a higher multidimensional poverty level, but the other one, the poverty intensity was a bit higher. And I, I pondered on the implication of that result. So <laughs> please, mother, <laughs> please, what can you say yes, no. the implication of that result? Why is it that way? Thank you. It means that in one community, um, intensity is higher, but incidence, the percentage of people who are poor is lower. And so when you multiply incidence times intensity, the MPI is lower. And in the other one, the incidence of farmers is higher, but each farmer is perhaps deprived in fewer things, so intensity is lower. And so um, you can comment on both of them. It means that it'll be more expensive to get each person in the lower MPI group out of poverty, but the percentage of the population that you'll have to get out is lower. So um, that's, in a sense, the practical interpretation. I don't know if that helps. But well yes. done for thank applying so the work. Much. I'm really excited. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, like one, two, so we have last two questions quickly before we run out of time. Solomon, please go ahead. Solomon? OK, so okay. he's not. OK. Yeah. OK. Thank you very now much. Go ahead. Yeah, my my name is um, Solomon, as you can, as you said, um, from the University of Ghana. I hold a master's there now at the Christian Albert University at Germany. I've worked with this um, MPI for some time. And then what I want to find out is the inclusion of um, um, intangible issues like uh, happiness and other things that cannot be actually measured 
economically. So I'm asking if there are ways that we are trying to include some of these things because as we always say, um, poverty is relative. And so different people see themselves differently. You might think he's poor, but he himself does not see himself to be poor and all that. So how are we working around this to include other, these other attributes um, in the poverty measure of the MTI? Thank you. Thank you so much, Solomon. And yes, Ghana is another fascinating country that has the MPI and it's systematically putting it into a lot of their different data instruments. So we're learning a lot. Um, so in terms of um, your question, um, so happiness is going to be different. So what I don't want you to think is that if I'm happy, I'm not poor. Because as I mentioned of Tamang or others, there are poor people, and Amartya Sen speaks of them often, who have serenity, have inner peace. Um, and yet they also may live very destitute or deprived lives. And that's a momentous achievement that they have this happiness and this serenity. And so we need to me measure both, but don't say because she's happy, we don't care about you know, her deprivations. We still have to care. So we just have to be careful in how we use that information. Phase six of the mix, multiple indicator cluster survey of UNICEF has the standard life satisfaction control ladder questions. You can just cut and paste those to look at them. They're very fast. They're probably not the best questions for happiness. You would also want to look at positive and negative emotions, and you'd want to look at meaning and purpose in life. OFI has a module on psychological well-being where you can look at all of those questions and select the ones to, if you need to add them to a survey. Um, but the point would be to not to include them in poverty, but to analyze them alongside it. And it's really quite important because you can see that some of the poor um, are happy and some are bitter, some are cynical, some are depressed. And that's very important, especially after the pandemic. And especially because if you're depressed, um, you just, it takes more energy to get going. And so it's, it's important to understand and to offer different kinds of support um, as we're coming out of this difficult time. Um, but so far people are keeping them as separate measures, but then we can cross them to see the different kinds of support that different, different people have. So, so last question, one last question from Jakaria follow up and then then I think you already time, you know, it has been one and a half hour and it is getting late for you. So Jakaria, quickly. You're muted. You are muted. Okay, so just a uh, very quick question. Let us say that we make our own relative deprivation kind of formula and we put it for Kerala. And of course, over time, all the countries will, or all the societies will, you know, come at some level where they will do that. Have you thought about a systematic, uh, you know, formula for this, for a global MPI? Or is it still, you know, in the... Yeah. So think about monetary poverty. You have the $1.90 a day, 3.20 a day, 5.50 a day, $10 a day of the World Bank. And those can be compared. They're like the global MPI vulnerability. We also have a measure of destitution. If we get a measure of moderate poverty, it would be like that. You can compare. But nearly every country in the world has a national measure. And those cannot be compared. They are used by the statistical offices. They're used by policymakers. They draw on national surveys but you can't compare them. So in world development indicators, they both sit alongside, but if you wanna know how many million people are poor, use the World Bank figures. And if you want to know anything about national policy, use the national. It's the same for the MPI. So if you wanna do an aggregate, you need a global, which is why we have to get a measure of moderate poverty at the global level, which we don't have. It doesn't work for Kerala, um, but, 
if you make one, and then if you know it's different from the one that's made for um, the sutu, that's okay because they will be reported as indicators um, in world development indicators or other other data sources. But so long as people understand that they cannot be compared, they're useful for that country, then they have their intended purpose. That's good. So with this, uh, uh, Dr. Alkir, it is, it is, let's conclude it. It is wonderful talk and I'm glad that you could join. And as you know, I think I mentioned to you, my plan was that to host you in person and I have always wanted for years. So my hope is that this is just the introduction and once COVID is behind, we will have fortune of hosting you at the University of Arizona and show you also the desert, you know, which will be very different from London. So thank you for a wonderful talk and I will keep in touch with you. And good thank evening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thanks to thank all you. of you. Good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, everyone.